Hello everyone, um, welcome to this session. Um, I've just realised one of our peer researchers wants to join, but he needs the link. So I'm wondering if um, Aminia or Lily, if you could send the link or Annabella to Afosaware um, so he can join because he hasn't registered. That would be okay. Thanks, Annabella. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay. So, so welcome everybody. Uh, yeah, he'll just, uh, Annabella, he'll just need the link that we had in the email if you can send that. Um, so it's a, it's a privilege to be here um, and to uh, welcome you to our session. Thank you to Vera for the introduction uh, and thank you to everybody uh, who's been part of this network. As Vera said, we're very sad that today we're missing uh, Kirill Shaparov and his team from Ukraine who were supposed to be presenting with us. And so it's it's very heartbreaking that they, uh, they can't be with us today because they're doing really excellent work there and we've learned a lot from, from them and uh, they kindly shared their, um, their uh, slides uh, on working uh, with peer researchers in Ukraine, which we actually use for training our peer researchers in, in Ghana as well. So that exchange has been really fruitful for us. So uh, I'm going to share some slides just to give you a bit of an outline of where we'll be going in the next hour and a bit. Um, so I'll be doing a little kind of uh, walk around the world uh, for our different projects. So uh, I'm hoping that, um, there we go. Thank you, Annabella, we, we're on. So, okay. Um, so let me just, okay. Give me one minute, my computer's getting a bit old and slow. Okay. So um, so I'm Ursula, Ursula Reid. I was at King's College London. I still am a little bit, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm primarily at the University of Warwick now in the UK. Um, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview of um, peer research uh, with people with disabilities uh, and some of the issues. Uh, then I'm going to hand over to our colleague, Lily Poby at the University of Ghana, who's going to tell us um, about working with uh, peer researchers in Ghana for our project there. Then uh, Jassi Sandar and her colleagues uh, will be talking uh, about their research in Uganda. Uh, and Tube Lele uh, from Zimbabwe will be presenting on her work there. Then we'll have a short break. Uh, and then finally, Diana, who has flown out to Greece uh, from Indonesia, the Universita Universitas Gajamada, will present about her work with peer researchers there. And then finally, uh, Annabella Ossetutu from the University of Ghana will host uh, a Q&A at the end. Um, so, so without further ado, I will start. Please, if you have any comments, questions, uh, please do put them in the chat. So what is peer research? Well, it's a participatory method in which people with lived experience of the issues being studied take part in conducting the researchers, research. And peer researchers use their lived experience to help generate information about their peers for research purposes. So they may be involved in assisting with research de design, developing research tools, collecting and analyzing the data, or writing up and disseminating the findings. So the whole research process. And I think one of the challenges for the projects in, in, uh, in this network has been that we've obviously had a very limited time. We had six months initially, uh, limited budget, uh, we got most of us got extensions, um, but ideally um, to do real participatory research and to work with peer researchers in a, in a meaningful way throughout the research process, you'd want to be starting right at the beginning and you'd want a whole lot more time. So why do peer research? Um, to begin with, it, it enables people who are often marginalized, people with disabilities um, to, to be heard. So they can use their existing networks and relationships to involve subjects who might not otherwise be included. It is argued that peer research is empowering because it's committed to conducting research with and for the people who are the research subjects. 
And so challenging some of the power asymmetries that exist between researchers and subjects. And then there is the added value of lived experience. So the experiential knowledge and insights um, can increase understanding of these issues and enhance the depth and research of the of richness of the research. So people who have lived experience of living with a disability, they know best what that is like. They are the ones who can tell us uh, and, 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 and describe to the world what it is like to live with a disability and to be, um, to be, uh, um, to be engaged in research is, uh, is, is vital for this group who are often, as we know, in the various countries that we've been involved with, have been very marginalized. Working with peer researchers can also help us to gather best, better data. Um, so shared experiences between the research team and the subject reduces the risk of mis misunderstanding and increases the likelihood that the research will be relevant to the participants. And participants may respond more honestly and openly to someone who they know has similar experiences and has had themselves experienced a disability. And importantly, working with peer researchers can help activate communities. There's often a debate around the extent to which researchers should be involved in activism and advocacy and breaking down some of these barriers between researcher and subjects and bringing people together for a common cause as researchers and as allies can help to break down some of those distinctions and enable us to move from research to activism. And that's also the case for peer researchers. So building their confidence and self-esteem, particularly as I said, for people who are often more marginalized, can enable them to also get involved in advocacy and activism and, and speak up for themselves and um, promote the rights of, of people with disabilities. So we've seen through our own research that this is a way in which people with disabilities can gain experience and training in, in research, but that's also um, they may not want to, uh, some people become researchers and work in research, but others may want to use some of those skills for other reasons, for advocacy, um, uh, for, for, um, for activism, for, for campaigning. And so some of these skills have those transferable qualities for journalism, for example, some people are interested in, in working with the media. Um, and so these skills uh, in asking questions, in engaging people, in um, uh, promoting findings can be useful in those fields as well. But there are, of course, a lot of uh, challenges and, a, and an active critique in some ways that often participatory or peer-based research can, can be tokenistic. So particularly when um, you know, research is increasingly calling for the involvement of people who are um, the, the research subjects traditionally for them to be involved in, in, in data collection and in developing the research questions. Um, there's a risk that it just becomes tokenistic. And I think that was a risk in our research, particularly because of the, the short time scales, as I said. Um, there are these power inequalities and hierarchies, and we see them play out over and over again between people in academia and the people who are the, I mean, even the subject, using the word subject uh, makes us realize how, how ingrained these hierarchies are and how difficult it can be to break them down. And the risk is that sometimes these uh, hierarchies can actually become reinforced um, because they, 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 the, the researchers retain the, the positions of influence. They have the institutional backing, which often peer researchers do not have. And we can see this in terms of remuneration and job security, because peer researchers are often hired on short term contracts, they may be paid less than other research team members. So you can see that that those that precarity that is actually a, a feature of academia, um, but it plays out much more for people who are peer researchers who may be working on a kind of freelance basis, they are not may not be directly employed by the university or, or other research institution. So, um, so this, is, this is, a, is a challenge. I think often research funders and research institutions and ethics committees don't fully understand how true participatory research works and how co-producing research, what, what is needed for that um, from the beginning of the research process and, and going forward. 
And of course, there's a, these are issues that for all kinds of peer research, but I think particularly when we're working with people with disabilities, there needs to be built in reasonable adjustments, safeguarding issues to make sure that people can participate, whatever their, their ability or disability. And so building in time for that and, uh, and funding for that is also another issue. Um, and there's heterogeneity in people's experience. Just because people share a disability doesn't mean that they actually have the same experience in other parts of life, gender, um, uh, the kind of disability you have, um, the, um, the way it's affected you may not be the same. And sharing experiences can also create barriers because people may feel um, that they don't want to um, be, uh, be aligned with a certain group, for example, as particularly when there are when conditions are stigmatized. So what have we learned? We've learned that peer research is possible and valuable and there are opportunities for mutual learning, enhancing empathy and promoting inclusion, but we know that participatory can't be rushed and there is this need for time and flexibility and to consider the impact on timelines and budgets. We need time for adequate training, not just for the peer researchers, but for the wider research team, how to do this, this kind of research and take this approach. And it's important to consider the well-being of peer researchers and the research team as a whole and build in time for debriefing, reflection and support. And there is a risk, uh, I think particularly that struck us in the countries where we're working, of overburdening people who are lived experience experts, because there may not be many people who are open about their disability and have the necessary qualifications to be, to be working as peer researchers. So the implications are that funders and research institutions need to build in sufficient time and resources for meaningful peer research with people with disabilities. And adjustments and support need to be integrated into funding, research planning and timelines to enable equitable participation of people with disabilities as peer researchers. And we need to consider what is needed for peer researchers to be engaged from the outset. So in this project, people came in once the research questions had already been developed, but ideally you would want people to be involved right from developing the research questions, the proposals, not just in more routine aspects of data collection. And we need to consider how peer researchers can be supported at the other end of research, so at the beginning, but also at the end in producing outputs, uh, engagement activities and publications. And then we need to take into account that lived experience is intersectional, that age, ethnicity, religion, class, as well as disability, all shape people's lived experience. So um, we've got uh, several projects which are going now going to uh, be presenting. So we're starting with Ghana. Uh, I want to hand over to Dr. Lily Pobi, the University of Ghana, if you could just introduce yourself. And she's going to talk about Ghana. Um, and we have the YouTube links, which I'm going to put into the chat so that if the videos that we're using don't work, you can just click on the YouTube links and watch them yourself. So thank you very much and thanks, Lee. Thanks, Ursula, and, and hello, everybody. It's, it's good to be here today. Um, I'm just going to just briefly introduce our project and focusing mainly on our experiences working with um, together with peer researchers. And then we would um, show the videos in which our peers, two of our peer researchers reflected on their experience. So um, just briefly, as Esla said, I'm Lily Kobi from the University of Ghana, and I was a co-investigator on, on the project. Our project was looking to understand the impacts of COVID-19 on people with se severe or serious mental health conditions in Ghana. Um, we had a counterpart project in Indonesia, but I'm focusing on the Ghana aspect. And we also wanted to look at how we could maybe through this project inform guidelines to include, to make more inclusive decisions and, and have people with lived experience be included in recovery plans post pandemic. Um, particularly for the project, we wanted to understand how the pandemic and, and how things like the government's responses or interventions had impacted people's health. And, and in this case, we mean people who had a lived experience of serious mental health um, difficulties. So we're looking at how it had impacted their health or their relationships, their livelihoods, and just generally their daily lives, um, including things like access to healthcare and social protection schemes. 
Um, but we also wanted to explore whether there were any impacts on things like the human rights, um, because we had um, in the past heard of some stories and, and witnessed some instances where human rights were a concern for people who had lived experience of mental health conditions. So we wanted to see whether there were any such impacts on human rights as a result of the pandemic, whether, whether there was more coercion or exclusion and so on. But beyond the um, potential negative consequences of the, of the pandemic, we were also interested to understand how people were coping um, with you know, the way the world was these days. So we wanted to do that by examining things like the, the kinds of resources that they had, the, the types of support they were getting, where the, the support was coming from, whether, there was, whether people were able to access such support and things like that. And through these findings, we were hoping to um, identify the best ways in which we could include people with lived experience of mental health conditions in recovery plans and programs. Um, it, as Aslan mentioned, it is easy to ignore people who are more vulnerable or who are more marginalized. And so we wanted to look at how we could use our findings and our experiences in the field to inform guidelines, make recommendations to policymakers and so on. So our methods for this project were participatory in nature. Um, we conducted two participatory action workshops, which included people with lived experiences and their caregivers and other stakeholders in mental health in Ghana um, to develop our interview questions and our observation approach. We wanted to, to, be, um, to get suggestions and to, to get ideas of how we should approach it, observations of people's general daily lives as a result of the pandemic, what kinds of questions we should focus on and so on. So we had a couple of PAR workshops to, to help us to fine tune that. And then we also recruited four people with lived experience, two males and two females, um, to act as peer researchers for this project. So our peer researchers were recruited through, you know, partner um, project partners, the, like the Mental Health Society of Ghana, Basic Needs Ghana, and even in, through our individual networks and so on. We, we distributed adverts for the position and, and people applied. We interviewed them and, and, and then recruited four of them at the end of the day. So together with our colleagues in Indonesia, we, we received, um, our peer researchers and the researchers on the team received training on how to do peer research when in collaboration with the McPin Foundation. Um, and so the training covered things like the general research methods, ethics during research, self-care and safeguarding and things like that, things to think about when you're doing peer research. Um, the sessions were done online, but before we went into the field, we also did a few in To, um, to be sure that everybody was comfortable with the approach that we were using and how the, the data collection was going to go. Um, and this was actually quite useful. The in-person training allowed us all to practice getting consent, how to conduct an interview. Um, it gave us the opportunity to go over, you know, the standard of operating procedures or the pathways for the research, to also fine tune individual safeguarding protocols and wellness plans for the peer researchers and the research team as a whole. And it gave us a, an opportunity to, um, to practice the interview. And through that, we were able to identify some triggering questions, which then led to discussions about support options and things like that. So, so these in-person contact uh, sessions were very helpful in shaping our research questions and even how we approached going out to do data collection with the peer researchers. Um, the peer researchers were paired with a researcher for a member of the research team for each interview. And we limited um, our interviewing to just one or two at most interviews per person per day. Um, after each interview, we, we would do a debriefing session where we would discuss the experience and look at any things that um, were of concern or any strengths that had been identified, things that we needed to pay attention to and so on. So generally working with the peer researchers was very enlightening and very helpful also because they approach interviews with a lot of empathy and understanding and, and actually a lot of desire to, to um, engage with people who had similar 
even if not um, identical experiences as them. Um, and they were enthusiastic about participating in, in research from, from the other side, rather than always being participants or subjects of something, a, a research that is going on, they were able to be on the, on the researcher side. So they were, we, we could see how empowering it was for them to be included in, in discussions about mental health in a positive way rather than always being um, being seen as vulnerable or marginalized and so on. So it was quite empowering for them as well. But um, we also had to overcome some issues. The first being that the distance of online training was quite difficult for us all in the beginning. Um, it, it, it lent a certain um, remoteness to the whole process. And so it was difficult to build trust and rapport when you know, they did not know us, we did not know them except online. And so we found that the in-person sessions were helpful to gain that trust and to build that rapport. And it allowed a sense of belongingness to feel as though we were working as a team or to working as a group all together. And so generally working with the peer researchers during this pandemic has really been a learning process for all of us. Um, we have had to be more careful and more, more intentional about things like self-care and, and ensuring that the pace was not too rigorous or too demanding. So for me, for instance, this, this process has actually forced me to pay more attention to the process of, of research and not just you know, the data or the desired outcome. Those kinds of things can sometimes cloud the research process because we are, we are focused on getting the data, understanding people's experiences that the whole process can sometimes get lost in the mix. So um, these are of my reflections and I, thought we could now then switch to the videos where our peer researchers told us about some of their own experiences. So back to you, Ursula. Thank you, Lily. Uh, so this is where technology we hope will be on our side. Uh, so I've put the two links. Um, we've used, we're using videos because we weren't sure um, how well the internet would hold up for us. Uh, as many of us know, uh, sadly, access to the internet is not equitable around the world. Um, and so I'd like to say that SNM and Fosaware are always with us here. And I think I don't know if Hanan uh, and Lisa are here too, but um, uh, I don't know. SNM, do you want to just say hi if you're on the call of Fosaware and we can show your videos? Hello, hi. everyone. My name is SNM Dra and I was one of the peer researchers on the project. It's a pleasure to be here. And also uh, a YouTuber and made the videos, I would like to just add. So, uh, yeah. Oh, Fosuare, are you around? Yes. Hi, Fosuare. Yeah. So, my name too is uh, Fosuare Joseph Stanley. Um, um, I was also part of the research. Uh, project as a co-researcher and I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you, I'm sorry. Great, the internet is on our side today. Okay, so I'm going to share the film that you and SNR made in there. This was done in the grounds of um, the university. I'm just going to play it from the same YouTube link you have. So if there's a problem with the sound, um, just just uh, switch off the, the sound for the for me and then you can just uh, play it yourself. So I'm hoping this will work. Okay. Oh, I've got Mac Pin's page. So yeah, you can check out Mac Pin, who are experts on this thing on this link. Okay, so I'm going to play S num first. So So personally, during okay. the COVID-19 pandemic, I wasn't really affected because I was in a different environment. So the peer research gave me the opportunity to ask people questions and get their experiences. And it made me realize that many people were affected during the pandemic, people with lived experience, and also people in a position to help people with lived experience. So I had the opportunity to interview the stakeholders, and I found out from them that even some of the staff started developing mental health conditions because of the level of stress the pandemic put on them. And then there were issues with shortage of medication, especially stakeholders who were doing medical outreaches. They were not able to continue with their outreaches and give to, to people with lived experience free medication. So 
I just realized that it's the pandemic did not only affect people with lived experience, but it affected people who help people with lived experience to be able to um, cope during the um, pandemic. So I would like to be involved in doing more research because I now know that doing research has um, the power to make me create change as a whole in my country in the tiniest way possible. I know that all this research will one day cause people in power to change certain policies to help people with lived experience. So I'm glad that I had this opportunity and I look forward to doing more research because I really had a good time and I know that I'm helping people with greater COVID-19 is still around, but it's not as severe as it was in the first two years of the pandemic. It doesn't mean that the effects of the pandemic have gone because people are still struggling to buy their medication. Things have become very, very expensive. So I would like to do a research that talks about post-COVID in a way so that policymakers can realize that yes, COVID-19 is still having an impact, especially on people with lived experience. So thank you very much, Esanam. So I'm just, I'm going to go very quickly to uh, Officer Wari's video. Sorry. Right, let me escape. With their lived experience, me being a person with their lived experience and working as a researcher on this project helps me to understand the participants from a practical experience. As the participants speak their experience and how they felt during the COVID 19. I understand them clearly because I have also gone through their situation to a certain degree. So I could relate to them and even feel their pain and frustration. I learned self-care. The support system that was in place for the researcher was very great before the project. I used to be hard on myself during my working time, but I was taught during the project that I need to take one thing at a time. I need to relax and pause when I am tense, and also need to break when I am triggered. Also, I learned from the participants when they share their story about how their condition started and how they were able to make through to the point they are in in their recent life. I was happy to learn how people cope during the COVID in their condition. And I didn't know there was such a provision as self-help care group for people uh, with uh, psychosocial disability. I'll be more happy to assist if I have the chance in any way to act to help the uh, to help people like me achieve their proper well-being. I would like more research done in to find out the root cause of this psychosocial disabilities and how these disabilities can be cured completely. Thank you very much, Ofosiware uh, and SNM for those videos. And I've put the link to um SNM's uh, YouTube, so is Lily. So please do check it out.
Um, and yeah, so we're going to have time for some questions at the end, hopefully, but I'm going to hand over now to our the next project in our network. Um, so, uh, Jassy, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ursula, and thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see so many people. Um, okay, someone, I think, Ursula, are you still sharing your screen? You're on mute as well. I did stop share, so I hope. And let I me try again. I can see you on my screen. Not Okay, I think I fixed it. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, great. Yeah, we can see it, thanks. Amazing. Okay, thank you so much for being here again. Um, I am working with a team in Uganda and unfortunately our colleagues can't be here, so it's just going to be me from the project. Um, so our project is entitled Implementing Participatory Action Research to Explore the Impact of COVID on War-Affected Disabled Populations, including ex-child soldiers in Uganda, in, specifically in northern Uganda. I am Jesse Sander and I'm at the University of Bristol and we're working very closely with our partners in northern Uganda, who are a community-based organisation uh, led by former child soldiers and they support the war-affected community in northern Uganda. Um, so some of the things that I want to talk about today is the methodology and data collection, co-production and epistemic justice, co-produced outputs, and, and I'll show you an example of one of those, um, the stakeholder dissemination and some of the key learnings from working with people with disabilities as co-researchers. <clears throat> so the methodology and data collection for this project began in June and ended in December 2021. However, we are still working with our co-researchers. Participatory action research centered persons with disabilities throughout the whole process. Um, so the people, the facilitation team in northern Uganda, so for example, Yolred and uh, the research that we're working with, uh, do not identify as people with disabilities. So it's really essential to make sure that we had the voices included of those people most impacted by uh, COVID-19 as disabled populations. So we employed 16 persons with disabilities in northern Uganda who became part of the project team as co-researchers. So we became one big project team. The 16 people that we worked with, none of them had worked in research prior. They might have been sort of research uh, participants in uh, other research projects, but they had ne never sort of been researchers. The employment contract that we had, and the employment contract was with the local NGO, um, Yorred. The employment contract included data collection, included output production, stakeholder dissemination and engagement activities. Um, to ensure fairness across the team, um, all of the co-researchers, as well as the facilitators, as well as myself, when I was involved in the participatory action workshops, were all paid the same um, to kind of overcome some of the challenges of working with people with disabilities. And um, our co-researchers were all adults, so we worked with predominantly women. So there were 12 women and four men. The median age was 38, but our age range from uh, sort of 19 to 70. So we collected data with the co-researchers um, sort of over 12 days, but over four months. So the period of data collection was very slow. Um, and I'll explain how we went through collecting that data. The co-researchers were involved through every step of the project and they're still involved because we're still finalizing some of the outputs um, and including in the production of outputs as well as the dissemination events. So the way that we organized it was that during the first week of the participatory action uh, workshops, we uh, went through, we focus a lot on ethics and ethics protocols. So because of the University of Bristol and as well as local authorities in northern Uganda require the um, information sheets and ethics approval, we did uh, create that as a project team. But then we went to our co-researchers and said, what additional safeguarding measures do you require? And um, we explained what ethics really meant, um, how they could uh, ensure that their kind of safety was the safety was paramount and how they can ensure safety of themselves as well as other people we went through um, what a baseline survey is why we would complete a baseline survey and we just ensured that all of the consent procedures were in place um, consent was also ongoing so even now if we are sharing anything with our um 
partners or with stakeholders, we do get the consent of the co-researchers that we've worked with. On the week, uh, the second week, or I guess the second week of the workshops, we went through the data collection. So the team in Northern Uganda went through a research methodology, how you would conduct research, the purpose of research, um, different methods, and we asked the co-researchers what they wanted to do. So they chose interviews, focus groups, and arts-based approaches. The arts-based approaches were sort of storytelling, poetry, drawing, and sketching. The um, next set of workshops focused very much on solutions and strategies, and that was basically around sort of how, we, how the strategies could be disability inclusive um, and specific solutions which would support in pandemic recovery, but we aligned it so it'd be local and social, local, social, cultural context, but also national. Um, just to go back to on the data collection, what we also did was, for example, if the team had chosen to do interviews, they would then come up with the questions that they wanted to ask each other, but also the questions that they didn't want to answer or didn't want to ask each other. So it gave them um, a chance to really sort of discuss some of the taboo subjects or some of the sub or some of the topics that might cause trauma to each other and the individuals, but also to construct kind of questions which would be helpful and also a bit more positive for them. And in the final uh, data collection workshops, we had cultural and arts-based sharing and dissemination with family and friends of the co-researchers. So we had two days of, uh, or I think it's actually a final day of sharing with people with disabilities and their networks, um, just to show what had been achieved and just sort of a celebration of the work that had been collected um, during the period. So that's the data collection. Here are our co-researchers. And this is at one of the stakeholder events that we held. Um, and here are, I think they are going through the focus I think they're coming up with focus group questions in these and maybe some of the animation. Um, so co-production epistemic justice. So the team in Uganda, Yolred, have done quite a lot of work on safeguarding and safeguarding um, the beneficiaries that they work with. So Northern Uganda is one of the most heavily researched uh, contexts, especially post-conflict. And um, there is a lot of exploitation and extraction of information that takes place. And so Yolred have worked very closely with, their, with the people that they sort of um, their beneficiaries to ensure that research is beneficial and doesn't cause harm to the local communities. One of the co-researchers said that research can be done, but there is often no feedback. Collecting information is easy, but following up what was taken from me seems a challenge. It will be hard for me to know what exactly the information I gave did and where it was shared. Um, so one of the things that we said from the uh, sort of the um, beginning was that all of the uh, outputs would be produced as much as possible with co-researchers. So, um, and community have the previously sort of voice that outputs and feedback is not shared with them, um, but they're also excluded from the discourse and research about them because of, as we, as many of us might know, academic publishing is um, quite elitist and the language and the vernacular that's used in academia can also be quite in inaccessible, but also the lack of translation into local languages. Um, many of the people that we've worked with can understand, they, they, they can understand English to a very small, small extent, but they speak the local language and they don't read the local language. So any sort of outputs would have to be verbally translated. And many of them said that that doesn't seem to happen. Um, so where the data ana analysis was done by the researchers or the facilitation team, the preliminary findings have been shared with co-researchers so they can amend um, what has been uh, kind of identified as key themes or they can add to it. And co-researchers were involved in the production of outputs, <clears throat> which is the main one was an animation which was designed and co-produced by the co-researchers, which I'm going to show. And this is where they were coming up with kind of the script and some of the, um, the storyboard for the animation. So I'm going to show you the animation here. I won't probably show you all of it because of time, but let's see how far we get. And if you can't hear it, can someone just let me know? Ma chalong ya matika kuo kengo aliko marami yoganda kuo peyot. Mete kum eno ne watie ki pera ma pat pat ma diyo kuo wa ma chalong lokom teach ngom odi me bedo chente me chuluti ana wai gangkwan kon me oyat ka bedo ke gian ma chama ma ano corona food pain o no wa limu luremwa ka chel ke jog gangwa ke bene o no wa ripe kianwa. En toy kar me corona donyo, tiak pa kuo meta meda, luar dugu duong, 
Pitamo kirma wa wikuwa kwede. Macha la ngolo. Tuo ni mano. Peo bi weho deno chana bi meta meda. Obi guru kuona ni ning. Jo ganga ki jo mea duola. Korano kero pera ma duon ikuwa wa. Ubalo yu kuwa wa mapere tek bo jo ganga. Yu me ot ya tu dugu tek. Uwe kope wa ramo no kanyi me ot ya tu. Uwa me kecho mete. Pien jo wa ganga. Pere ki kero me no lemi. Me no cham. Pien yu me no yu me tiyo lemi. Udaro ubale wa ramo. Kwan po lo teno na ubale. Ma te loka ne giti gang. Don giti gang kama jami mukene doge don pera wati ka yele kichulo at wegi odi giti ka pe kiki jai chwingi malope kiet ma chulo at wamer ne omiara wanong jami dusho ento wanone wati ka jenge ikom dano ne konya wa. Ento pol kare dano ol kikonyo joma tie kakuo kingolo tutwale kagen bene kitie kijo gange ma bene umiro dukony. Ekare mano tu corona peting an mama no miro kuo kweda adongo kena piano no giwaju ni ngacha malangolo ni tiki tu corona piu checha kwede. Mama na keke na ye uno konya kwa eno kelo cham eno wako ke kama bo timi chimbuto kina na wachalo dano makongi pere omete karmi tu corona pia dano tamu ni watiki tu corona owe rogi luaro wa dage bero ma bo bo kwa dwa kede beti watini jamu wengi mau pare me gua kumwa pati jo mo kene. Waki lupo chik maki karo mi buwaka ki iko mkubo korona. Don wawinyo malit kake poko waki ki ndano. Machale wan ndano ma utika kuwa ki ngole ma pat pat. Tuwa korona odwa kwa ruwa mwapin menungo gina na chama. Ukelo tam ki para ma pol iwi wa tutwal. Don walego ludirudini ludiru tekwaro. Lutela maki yero kia yera. Meneno ni ki kero lungolo iruwa mtela ma pat pat. Ma chiel. Walego ni kiketi lutela palo ngolo, iruwa mtela duju ma pat pat mati lobo man. Maa rio, ludirudini, ludiru tekwaro, lutela maki yera kia yera, ki idilo beju kit, me binu kalarwa ki pero man. Maa dek, gamente, miru tiel kowa, ki gina na chama, machalo mchile, muranga, moho, ki gina makonyo wa guwako leo, Gamente miru nong iwa kabiru uyup odi iwa. Gamente miru chul kwan palu tiyan wa. Omini wa kony me ori yad me nono, ikar me korona ini kinge korona. O kwany kwe muchor ma pat pat, maki keri widan ma tika kwa ki ngolo ni, ikar me korona kinge kar me korona. O kwany wa woro, ma ngwen o kwany wa woro, ki ikoro jimi akora eto mi wa gina tima, Ma wa ramo timo ne me ke la lao lao e kuwa wa. Me a bitch, lo ngolo, duchu, miyergu ribe, ku betka chil, ma ki tiye lo kogi, ki konyo kogi, ma be wek lok do ge winye, ma a ti. Ok, so... That was an animation that was produced in December and... The co we decided that we'd share that with local uh, stakeholders. And uh, with the we had two sort of dissemination events, one with civil society organizations and one with other key actors. And the co-researchers were the ones who were identified the stakeholders and local actors that they wanted to invite. Um, during the stakeholder events, the presentations and interventions by co-researchers was made at various points, including presentations, as well as um, other conversations that they had. It was We brought together um, in various spaces over 70 local and national stakeholders. And it was the first time that many of them had shared, um, shared or asked questions to local leaders about their situations. And it was also the first time that a lot of them had been able to kind of ask, ask questions as a collective. Um, so I'm just going to share a video from my colleague, Joffrey, and one of the co-researchers. 
My name is Geoffrey Omon, uh, and I'm the program director at uh, YOLRED. Uh, today I want to share with you about my experience of working with, uh, with core researchers. Uh, one thing that I have learned is that working with them get, uh, get us to, to put into their own shoes, thereby uh, learning more about uh, their, their challenges and issues are facing them. Uh, the, other, the other one is uh, about the authenticity of the information that you get during the data collection. And uh, the third one is uh, reducing uh, the risk of harm. Uh, as they are meant to set their own uh, questions, those that can cause harm to them and those that doesn't. And then the other thing has been about the information uh, uh, sharing, which clearly brought about about the, about uh, uh, the difference between uh, disability and inability. And, uh, and so that's something that a lot of people do not understand. And uh, the last final one is about um, uh, realizing that um, uh, co-researchers themselves or persons with disability themselves are equally valued member uh, of the community. The only thing that makes the difference is that uh, we often or they are often denied the opportunity to actually uh, engage in this kind of work. Thank you so much. I'm here again on Nancy, that going through the quest. Give me a bear, my no, any error. My chin, or maybe an unquote error. Bombedicarian I mean, I'm being it, my dear, from the end of the day, to her ma, go out from auntie and to make you know your team, my child and my daddy are working all of them and and so on. Okay, and just to conclude with um, drawing on some of the key learnings that we've uh, sort of learned during this period. Um, one of the co-researchers said, we have attended so many workshops as persons with disability, uh, but this one has given me some hope. Um, okay, some of the things that Ursula has already mentioned, I'm just going to reiterate them. Um, the slower data collection aligns with local means of knowledge production, and it allows for considered answers. So, for example, if uh, an interview question um, had, when the interview questions had been designed, co-researchers had time to really think about what they wanted to answer. So they didn't do the interviews until the following week, which gave them time to really sort of come up with considered answers. The low, use of local language practices facilitators is essential for safety and trust. Everything was done in the local language. Um, even when I presented, it was very, very minimal and it was, um, it was translated the whole way. Uh, solidarity of people with disability through the project. There was a, a lot of shared learning and unity which showed itself. Uh, reduce the risk of harm by having co-researchers devise data collection tools and questions. Localizing the project allowed for more authentic data. Um, some of the things that we did find was that there was a need for greater flexibility and time. So, for example, if the co-researchers said that they wanted to do a form of, um, they want to use a particular method, it would require the uh, researchers to come up with the materials to teach them or train them in how to use that at a very short notice. Um, unlearning traditional research practices takes a lot of time. Um, and we found that even with the researchers based locally who are used to doing certain things in certain ways, also said that actually, you know, this, is take, this has also been a learning process for us. Um, there was a discovery of many hidden talents, especially when it came to the arts based production or um, uh, some of the kind of the singing or the poetry and the plays. Um, there was new knowledge, skills development and friendships which have emerged. A lot of the um, co-researchers are now very good friends and they will, um, they've kind of started a support network amongst themselves. Um, there's inclusion through every step, the empowerment and development of the whole project team, including the facilitators. Um, there was economic benefits of formally employing people with disabilities as co-researchers. As Ursula said, there is also the um, kind of the setback that they are on short term contracts, however. Um, and co-researchers were able to see some of the immediate results of the research through the animation, but also through the stakeholder event. Thank you very much. And I will hand it back over to Ursula. Thank you, Jesse. That was fantastic. It was really great. Um, 
So, okay, we are, of course, predictably enough running over time, but I hope people will be patient with us. It's wonderful to have so many people joining us. Um, so I'm now handing over to our, to Tubalele, to, to I think I'm not pronouncing that right, sorry, from uh, Zimbabwe. <laughs> Thank you, Esala. Hi, everyone. My name is Tubalele Samapena. I am from Zimbabwe. And I'm going to be uh, sharing our experiences in conducting research with researchers with disabilities. So let me look for my presentation and quickly share it. All right. Thank you all. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. Thanks. So we we. We conducted a pilot study to determine the perceptions and lived experiences of people with disabilities before and during the COVID-19 pandemic in Zimbabwe. We also sought to determine the inclusivity of, uh, of the healthcare system in Zimbabwe of people with disabilities. And then we also uh, sought to formulate and recommend key strategies for building back better a inclusive healthcare system in Zimbabwe. So we utilized participatory research methods to achieve an understanding of the challenges that people and to ensure maximum effectiveness of the research team, we recruited three individuals, uh, each with a disability, and we ensured that each had completed uh, tertiary education for to assist with our data collection activities which were mainly face-to-face -face interviews so this selection was done uh, purposely so that we could achieve disability inclusivity within our research team itself so we realized that uh, including core researchers with uh, disabilities themselves had certain uh, benefits some of which were that they had a knowledge of the appropriate and non-offensive terminology to use when discussing certain issues when, or when referring to people with disabilities, especially in our local languages, which are Ndebele and Shona. So we conducted, uh, I would say maybe 90% of our interviews in Shona. So they were very instrumental in actually advising us on what to say, how to approach people and what to say in certain situations. So we also realized that uh, our interviewees, our study participants were more at ease when they were being interviewed by core researchers with disabilities themselves and they were more open and we managed to get a, quite a lot of information that we would not have gotten otherwise. Uh, what we had to contend with the effects of conducting research during the pandemic because it was a, a new situation, the landscape was different. So, but then fortunately for us in Zimbabwe, uh, by the time we started our field work, our data collection activities, COVID-19 cases were on the decline, which meant that our uh, restrictions had been eased. For instance, travel restrictions had been eased and we were allowed to travel between cities, between provinces and we were able to travel down to our study site, which was good, which is a couple of uh, 100 kilometers away from the capital city club. Uh, however, uh, uh, as opposed to traditionally going into the field and collecting data, we realized that we had to invest in additional resources in order to protect our research team and to protect our study participants. And therefore, considerable, uh, considerable resources were devoted towards buying face masks, shields, sanitizers and all those things to ensure that we minimize the risk of infection. But we realized at the end of the day that we could not eliminate the risk of infection due to our chosen method of data collection, which were face-to-face -face interviews. There was always some anxiety associated with the possibility of infection. For instance, um, in cases where we had to interview hearing impaired uh, study participants, in addition to uh, the, the sign language interpretation, they also wanted to read lips and we were required it's, uh, in some cases to lower our face masks 
And then in instances when we were dealing with uh, children with uh, intellectual challenges, uh, everything went out the window. They did not understand why they had to wear masks. They did not understand the concepts of uh, social distancing. They did not understand why hand, sanit uh, hand hygiene was very important. And uh, to be honest, there were instances when social distancing was simply impossible. You had to sit a bit closer to your inter to your to the study participant, uh, so that you could clearly con uh, smoothly conduct the interview. Uh, you didn't want to sit far away and then use the excuse to say uh, we need to social distance. I would take that personally to say maybe this person is trying to avoid me or something. To be lay lay, so could as you, I said, sorry, could you put your slides on slideshow mode so they'll be a bit bigger for us? You know the slideshow, okay, mode. Slide. yeah. Then it will be a bit bigger. The print is a bit small for people, so yeah. If you do the slide, yeah, wonderful. Slide. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So as I was saying, our chosen method of uh, data collection was the face-to-face -face interview. And I did speak about the challenge associated with this, which was the risk of infection. At that point in time, that was sometime, I think in July last year, uh, uh, vac uh, vaccinations were not yet readily available and the majority of the research team were not yet vaccinated. So, so we were quite anxious about the risk of getting infected. But uh, fortunately, we, the benefits uh, sort of outweighed the challenges because we were able to pick up on verbal cues when we were conducting the face-to-face -face interviews. We were able to quickly pick up um, when the interview, we our study participants went into emotional distress and we had a counselor who traveled with the research team to provide counseling services to study participants who needed it. And uh, also we were fortunate enough to have as members of our research team, people with medical backgrounds, and we were able to refer uh, any study participants that we came across who needed maybe the referral services People, we, we kind of found out that people were not yet aware, information wasn't uh, getting to them as readily as it should have been. So they were not aware of what services had resumed. And we came across people, uh, epileptics, who were not aware that uh, their medication was now available at the health facility, be it the clinic or the district hospital. And so we had to advise them that those services were now available and they could get a service. Uh, when we were working with our, the core researchers with disabilities, our, our research assistants, we, we had uh, a deep briefing session at the end of each data collection session. So we got to discuss what they thought of the process, uh, any lessons learned, whatever thoughts they had, and they needed us to know, they, they said they, they needed us to know, they needed the whole research community to know that the capabilities of uh, people with disabilities should not be underestimated, especially when they possess the uh, similar skills or the appropriate academic qualifications to carry out the roles. And we also noted that even when we are working with core researchers with disabilities and we have to do field work and there are uh, special accommodations that have to be made for each uh, particular disability, those, uh, those resources, additional resources are not excessive and they can be incorporated into any study project without breaking the budget. Um, we were also, uh, we also wanted to provide support for our research assistants, uh, our core researchers with disabilities, because we were very much aware that these were recent graduates, even though they had tertiary education, they were recent graduates and they did not have much research experience. So we conducted a, a three-day workshop with them, training workshop with them on uh, methods or uh, culturally acceptable methods of approaching households. Uh, we, al uh, we also um, helped them establish rapport for communication during a, with conducting interviews. We also trained them on ethically sound consenting uh, uh, methods of consenting study participants. And then we also advise them on methods of watching sensitive issues because we were aware that when we we're going to get into the field, we we're going to come across such cases. And then prior to going into the field, prior to collecting data, we 
pre pilot, we pre-tested our data collection tools and our consent forms with them to ensure that they got enough practice such that when we actually now started doing the actual data collection, they would be more competent. And as the study coordinator leading up to the data collection, I was instrumental in mentoring them on uh, conducting interviews and on uh, properly consenting study participants. So our core researchers with disabilities uh, expressed gratitude of be, uh, of being able to participate in an exercise that would hopefully improve the lives of other persons with disabilities. But however, what we noticed was that there were instances whereby when they came into uh, highly emotional situations, they tended to over empathize and uh, were in danger of losing focus of our objectives. So again, this is when we had the support of our counselor who was traveling with the team who was there to provide counseling services, both for our study participants and for our members of the research team. And then the core, another interesting aspect was that our core researchers with disabilities, because this way, we got these ladies from Harare, some were from Harare, some were from Tare, but mainly urban areas. So when we went down to Gutu, which was a strike of a, a balance of urban and rural, they, they mentioned that they hadn't realized that the issues and challenges that people with disabilities face are similar across geographic locations and gender. So that was an interesting point to note. And they expressed a desire and enthusiasm to participate in any uh, more upcoming projects. And uh, uh, from our um, participatory workshops and from uh, working with our co researchers with disabilities, we managed to um, discover that uh, the areas of interest that co researchers with disabilities, are, areas of research interest that co researchers with disabilities have include the development of a disaggregated national database of statistics of disabilities in Zimbabwe, which we currently do not have. They also want to investigate the accessibility of services, not only just health services, but education and information and infrastructure. They want to uh, determine accessibility of health services to people with disabilities. And they are also interested in investigating, uh, in researching or uh, strategies to improve and sustain the livelihoods of people with disabilities. So unfortunately, we concluded our study last year and uh, I, I was trying to get some in touch with some of our co-researchers, but people are a bit busy, so we don't have a video. But then that's just a summary of our experiences here in Zimbabwe in working with co-researchers with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Esela. I'm handing it back over to you. Thank you very much, Tivalele. Thank you. So uh, yes, we, as I said, we are a bit running over time. Uh, we had built in a short break, um, but I'm hoping that perhaps if people do need a break, um, uh, we, we're, we're finishing in like 15 minutes. So I'm going to beg people's permission that we just continue. Um, uh, but if you do need to get up and have a stretch, uh, uh, please do, uh, you can keep your camera off. Uh, we won't know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, if you need to do that, please do. Uh, but just in the interests of time, I think we will have to, to, to carry on. Um, and we're extremely honored to have with us as well, uh, Diana Setiawati, who has been um, uh, doing the, running the research in Indonesia. She's just landed in Greece uh, on a whistle-stop tour of Europe. Uh, connecting with research teams here. So I'm just so grateful that she's made the time uh, to be with us. So she's going to introduce uh, the project in Indonesia. Thank you, Diana. I'm handing over to you. I can play the video for you, so don't worry about that. Okay. 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 Hello? Hello? You're on. <laughs> okay. Uh... Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Diana Setiawati from Center for Public Mental Health, Faculty of Psychology, Universitas Gejah Mata Indonesia. So I would like to a bit uh, uh, share a story 
where uh, we how we recruited the peer researcher in Indonesia. So we did uh, through uh, organi consumer organization that we uh, have been partnering for a very long time. And we also put uh, open recruitment advertisement in the social media. And then uh, we got so many interest from the uh, from the participants, but uh, very little from them have a mental health background or mental health. Yeah, yeah. Usually they 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 like far from the area. So then we do training. We did training uh, a bit quiet intensive training on how to to do interview about basic uh, research ethic, about basic research method a bit, and then also. We did kind of a, a psychological first aid, uh, so that they they know they like they know if something happened in in the field what to do, and also they has uh, uh, like uh, they know what to do to taking care of each other something like that, and also we did a. Uh, uh, disclose yeah uh, like a forum for disclosing each other but and they they tell their own story about how they uh, living with mental illness for uh, so long something like that so they know each other uh, be before they become a team uh, all the uh, training was conducted online because at that time in Indonesia we had a very big wave of uh, COVID-19 pandemic so yeah, sadly, we, we didn't make it uh, to do it uh, offline. Then after that, after that, uh, we, uh, yeah, we, the researcher uh, role in the, in the, the peer researchers role, they were supervised by, so four peer researchers supervised by three master researchers. And the, the, the role is meant to be uh, like the second person of in, in each interview and and also an, data analysis. But uh, but they they really very enthusiastic and want to do everything. So we will give them like more role in the in practical. So they involve uh, more than like further than what we expected. Actually, they are very they were very good. Uh, the obstacle, of course, we, we did uh, face the ob obstacle. Yeah. The obstacle that we found is that, uh, yeah, as, as seen, they, they were not having kind of a mental health background. Uh, sometimes uh, it is very yeah, difficult to, yeah, to train in the beginning. Yeah. And then also uh, the other obstacle is that they never did uh, research before, so they didn't really uh, expect to work or on the follow up. Yeah, like uh, they think that uh, the if the contract is only for month, for example, that's uh, finished. Uh, they uh, they not really familiar with such of expectation of a publication a, a report something like that. So so it must be difficult. So we we should be very clear in uh, in the beginning. Uh, that's the lesson learned and uh, also uh, not all of them have a passion on advocacy and research so work and uh, uh, relapse uh, experiencing relapse during, during the the interview during the uh, field work uh, but then they they manage to support each other uh, only. So that's another uh, good side of that. And they make friends, they, they can uh, uh, support each other. And we even then uh, made a workshop on uh, participatory video and they uh, work very well with other, uh, other people with mental uh, disorder about their experiencing, about their experiences uh, during the uh, pandemic, COVID pandemic. I think that's uh, all that I can share, Ursula. So maybe we can uh, also show the video of their, uh, their testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. We will do that. The 
finally, we have a um, video which uh, we made on Zoom uh, with our um, Indonesian peer researchers. So I'm going to just find that. Um, so, uh, and uh, Vera and their team very kindly edited it for us. So I'll just play that. My experience as a peer researcher is with live experience. Uh, I have the same experience with them. So I can feel what they feel when they share their story. Yeah, encourage me to be more brave, yeah, to be more like we're not alone. A lot of people having the same problem. For them, it's very torturing, yeah, because the hallucination looks real in their eyes, but in reality, it's different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're hearing voices that mock you, or, you know, sometimes we cannot. Uh, we cannot see what, which one is true. Uh, I told them that I am survivor of uh, schizophrenia. Yeah. So, you... they, yeah. yes, so they get more comfortable, share their stories to me, because they know I also have the uh, same problem with them. Uh, I used to chat uh, in WhatsApp with my researcher, my master researcher, but what I feel, I also talk about uh, what I'm feeling. Sorry, I oh, sorry. Uh, do that. Uh, can people hear me? I accidentally showed the ones without the caption. Thanks, Lily. Um, let me just uh, see if I can get the one, the right one. I apologize. Just give me one moment. I'll stop sharing. Sorry, we have a captioned one, which Vera very kindly did. Um, how did that happen? Just one moment. Um, best laid plans. I had to fix it up. One. I don't know, Vera, if you have the link. I had it and I don't know what happened. Okay. Indonesia. That was I thought the one. Just one moment. I think this is the one, but for some reason the captions are not showing. My experience as a yeah. peer researcher is Sorry, let the oh, here they are. Okay, sorry, I will play now. Let me just share the screen. I have the same experience with them, so I can feel what they feel when they share their story. Yeah, encourage me to be more brave, yeah, to be more like we're not alone. A lot of people having the same problem. For them, it's very torturing, yeah, because the hallucination looks real in their eyes, but in reality, it's different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're hearing voices that mock you, or, you know, sometimes we cannot. Uh, you cannot see what, which one is true. Uh, I told them that I am survivor of uh, schizophrenia. Yeah. So, they, yeah. uh, so they get more comfortable, share their stories to me, because they know I also have the uh, same problem with them. Uh, I used to chat uh, in WhatsApp with my researcher, my master researcher, but what I feel I also talk about uh, what I'm feeling after the, the effect of uh, interviewing mm -hmm. uh, and like that and what I feel uh, at the moment. Yeah, um, doing research during pandemic is also a challenge here yeah, because uh, you need to go to public places, uh, especially hospital yeah, where a lot of fires there and although we all be using masks, 
you already taking test antigen PCR, but if you're online, we feel more secure, yeah. And we can manage the time uh, and the problem of doing interview online is the internet connection. Yeah, I learned that uh, the researcher need to make sure that the peer researcher is in good condition if they want to need to do interview because when they don't have the good condition and on them, sometimes they can be relapsed or they get tired and get sleepy. Yeah, making sure that the peer researcher uh, already have good rest and already take their meal or medicine yeah. and don't give pressure to the peer researcher. We think that somebody want to kill us that somebody is following us you know like yeah. and that's that's not uh, that's not the fact but we have that feeling when i interview busuyanti she said that she had uh, she she experienced a uh, heart to get the medication for her daughter uh because uh in so she changed uh to another hospital uh, that's all. Okay. And I learned uh, I learned that uh, F, uh, F each for each uh, mental disabilities have her have his or her own uh, challenge. Yes, right. Like yeah. uh, like the experience from the bipolar is different from a uh, borderline is different from schizophrenia is different from uh, MDD, major depressive disorder, like that. Yeah. And, yeah. During the pandemic, uh, we, we people as people with mental disability uh, is afraid to go to hospital because uh, in some area, uh, the hospital become uh, a COVID hospital. Yeah. So, uh, so they they have to postpone their uh, consultation with uh, psychiatrists. Uh, so may uh, they might uh, be relapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, people with mental disability get used stigma. Still get used stigma in our society. Uh, usually, when we want to get a job, uh, uh, in particularly, because uh, in Indonesia. Uh, HRD uh, use usually to browsing our 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 Google googling our name and if they found uh, uh, this name is uh, have a problem they get rejected yeah yeah mm. well chance the internet connection eh? sometimes they freeze sometimes they good and the other thing is that when we do it online interview, we cannot uh, we cannot feel the expression of when when they share the stories because we are not in the same place. Yeah. So when we do it online, maybe we can get more uh, more feeling. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, is the community for people with schizophrenia in Indonesia and uh, we gather support uh, every week in the secretariat office. We meet there and we share our problems and share our uh, share our stories and they, sometimes they make advice, we should do this, we should do that and encourage us to take medicine don't don't stop the medicine. You have to take the medicine until the doctor told you to stop. And that what make me get medicine mm -hmm. every time. Uh, first time I know about KPSI is when my sister, my older sister, uh, research about uh, browsing about uh, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, we found their uh, their headquarters in Kampung Melayu, uh, and after that we go to KPSI, and we see the founder of KPS, KPSI, 
and talk about my 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 delusion and my hallucination before that we don't know that it's, it was called delusion and hallucination mm -hmm. uh, so after the suggestion from mas bagus uh, the founder of kpsi we go to a psychiatrist and uh, i get the medication of that until now i think the kpsi is become uh, a bowl like a bowl like uh, like uh something that we can lean on uh i think uh when we get stressed or we get a uh, burnout or something like that we can uh we can post in kpsi in facebook Kep facebook group kpsi and we get we can get the support from its member yep. KPSI we also uh, make new friends my thesis about uh, uh, design for uh, people with schizophrenia uh, with uh, approach the DSR, design science research, and the thumb theory, uh, which is technology acceptance model. Uh, and the, the application will be based on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. I want to fight for the right for the people with mental disability because uh, they need to be protected by law and by the government or by the country. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Diana. And thank you to Agung and Okia Okia for the video that they made with us. Um, so I see there's been a lot of active chat in the chat and I'm just so sorry because Annabella, we were going to take some questions. I don't know, Vera, if we have 10 minutes or so of people. We've got four minutes, I think. So we need five minutes to get people into the next room. Thank you. Okay. So Annabella, I'm handing over to you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful listening to all these projects and looking at um, what you have um, discovered. Very nice. And thank you all for the questions and comments in the chat. I think our time is really fast by, so we'll take one or two questions if they haven't already been um, addressed in the chat. We can still um, use the chat, but we can take two questions at most. Well, I don't see any hand up. Am I missing something? Do, do you see any hand? Yes, because the, the chat has been very active with questions and wonderful um, points for reflection. Does anybody who asked in, uh, questions in the chat want to, to say anything or any of the people have been involved in the research? Because I think we have some people from the research teams on the call. Right. So there was a question which was about um, ethics approval, which I think is always quite an interesting one, but I can't seem to find it now. Yeah, it was earlier up, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, just quickly on that. So, okay, yeah, so it's about um, how researchers from the develop, developing world or developed world, sorry, we can start interacting. So we, for um, our research, I'm quickly going to answer that one. For our research project, we had to get ethical approval from the University of Bristol, as well as a local research ethics board, and then with the national board in Uganda. And um, it was a conversation that we had, you know, it was us, myself and my, and the, the PI Professor Rachel Murray, as well as our colleagues in Uganda. And it did take a bit of back and forth with the ethics board, but a lot of the things, if as long as we could justify why we were doing certain things, for example, paying our co-researchers um, and talking about some of the previous work that we have done in our research projects, we were able to sort of justify and the research boards were kind of fine with it. Um, 
so yeah, so I think that there was, it was quite interesting having a bit of a, you know, a bit of a pushback, but also sticking to our guns a bit and saying that, you know, we've, we've worked hard at coming up with a project which we think is fair and this is why and this is how and this is how we want to conduct it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jesse, for that. Um, Asla, I think I, we have one minute. Our time is gone. So over to you again. Well, you, I just wondered if anybody, if you wanted to, anybody wanted to add to what Jesse had said, any of the other researchers um, about the analysis. Yeah, maybe. I was looking at your earlier response that what we put in the ethical process on paper is Hello, from what transpires in the field. So in the Ghanaian case, having two people, the um, one of the co-investigators and uh, working along with peer researchers sort of help to address any ethical issues that um, came in the in the film. Quite a lot of interest in the analysis process because Emilia Colucci who's with us, who was a uh, co-investigator with us as well, with, was using participatory video, mm -hmm. which helps us also to analyze. Findings. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. I mean, I was thinking about that, Teresa. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah. So what I was reflecting about the kind of the last stage of the process that was explained by uh, yourself and uh, uh, Lily and uh, uh, Diana was then to kind of meet with the um, peer researchers and producing a visual map of the of what was the preliminary analysis and. Uh, uh, I think we all uh, found it a very interesting process because it really helped to kind of structure what uh, the funding goes to help to compare some of the funding between Ghana and uh, Indonesia, for example, some similarity and differences and really structure then what would be the outcome of the research in terms of the papers. But then we also used the uh, key teams from this uh, visual mapping to produce, uh, uh, to kind of lead the development of um, participatory videos, uh, which was then for the follow up of that, both in Ghana and uh, in uh, Indonesia. And I believe they will be posted sometime soon as well. So perhaps an invitation, if you are interested, also see the part of the project to follow probably what Ursula and uh, Lily and Diana and myself, Twitter and other pages to see uh, the outcome. But that for you to know that was the end point also this uh, project uh, process of uh, visual mapping and then getting people to use video as a, a way of uh, representing these themes and these stories. Thank you and congratulations to all of you for a very interesting projects. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to Vera for hosting us. Thank you to all the participants. I want to say hello to Hanan, who's another of our peer researchers from Ghana, who's managed to join the call. Uh, and uh, sorry for those who couldn't join us, but thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to leap off now because I've got to join another session. So thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon or evening, morning, where, whatever time it is where you are. Thank you. Bye. Vera, can you please save the chat for us? Okay. Thank you so much, too. Hey, thanks, Hanan. Thank you. It's great to see you. Okay, catch you later. <laughs> bye, bye. 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 Bye, bye. bye Diana. Yeah. Having problems with their internet connection. Bye, Diana. Stay safe. Enjoy Greece. <laughs>